Good morning, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Fred Meyer, President and CEO of Red River College. Welcome to, the, to today's panel discussion, Reconciliation in Action, Understanding Call to Action 92. We are proud to partner with the Winnipeg Chamber of Commerce and the Indigenous Chamber of Commerce to bring you this initiative in honour of the 150th anniversary of Treaty 1, the original lands of Anishinaabe, Cree, OG Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. Living and working in Treaty 1 means that we are all in a treaty relationship, and there's a lot of work to be done to further define this for individuals and businesses, especially as we reflect on this milestone anniversary. This partnership is about coming together, sharing, learning, and listening, and we hope it will lead to more opportunities for reconciliation work to occur. I know that today's discussion will provide a lot of value for you and your business as you move forward in building your reconciliation strategy, which may include embedding the four seasons of reconciliation education. We've implemented this training at the staff level and we'll be making it available to students this fall. It provides important foundational knowledge that you and your staff can build on. We want to thank André Casabon, Director, Director of Productions Casabon, and the Four Seasons of Reconciliation for working with us to provide this training. She and her team need a huge round of applause for creating this program and working to implement it across the country. You will get to hear more from her in today's discussion. Red River College is continuing to explore ways to support professionals and businesses in their reconciliation work, including our new Indigenous community consultation and engagement online micro-credential courses that you can register for. This is part of our social innovation suite of courses that will be available as micro-credentials, so you can build on this specific set of skills and knowledge. And now, I will, pass, I will pass things over to Red River College Elder in Residence, Ms. Yuna Swan, to start us off in a good way today. And then to our moderator, Noah Wilson, Business Development Manager at Indigenous Young Entrepreneurs, Futurepreneur, and Co-Chair of the Winnipeg Chamber of Commerce's Truth and Reconciliation Advisory Council. We'll take it from there. Thank you. And now to Ms. Yuna. Yes. Here. Yeah. Okay. Um, take a new clay from, from the turtle clan, catch our bear spirit, little people are my protectors. Grandfathers and grandmothers, the ones that worked for the light of the Creator, to hear this prayer. And I ask for a blessing on each and every one of you that are attending this meeting. And I just pray that we're able to accept this information with an open heart and an open mind. And I want to thank you for giving us this era of truth and reconciliation. And I pray that all of the people that are involved, that we can turn to each other and engage with each other in a good, positive, loving way. And I just pray for all the good, positive things for everybody that's attending and all of the people who are presenting and all of the people that have been involved in making this event happen. So I pray for all the good, positive things, life-giving things, and things that are of love all the relations. Chimigwich, Ikosani, um, uh, Ms. Una, thank you so much for, uh, for the opening prayer. Um, and, uh, and my name is Noah Wilson, Bojo Ani, Noah Wilson, Indigenous Castle, Shkish, Kanagan, and Dunjiba. Um, like I said, my name is Noah Wilson, and uh, I am the Business Development Manager for Indigenous Young Entrepreneurs for Manitoba and Saskatchewan with Futurepreneur Canada. And I'm also very honored and humbled to be uh, the co chair of the Chamber. Uh, the Winnipeg Chamber's Truth and Reconciliation Advisory Council. Uh, I'm located in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Treaty 1 Territories, uh, the homeland of the Métis Nation. I'm also a proud member of Peguis First Nation and self-identify as a Cree man with 
French Ukrainian heritage on my mother's side of the family as I was taught to acknowledge both my grandmothers and you know I strongly believe that small business and small business creation is the bedrock of the Canadian and local Winnipeg economy so that's it's my absolute privilege to be here with you all today and uh, and to work for Futurepreneur which is helping entrepreneurs uh, between the ages of 18 and 39 uh, build business plans and cash flows for their startup um, or their side hustle uh, with mentorship as well. But that's enough about me. It's uh, it's my absolute pleasure to be your host and moderator um, today. And first and foremost, um, with deepest gratitude to our event partners who made uh, today possible, I just want to acknowledge uh, the Indigenous Chamber of Commerce, uh, Red River College, and of course, the Four Seasons of Reconciliation. As a chamber, we're thrilled to host today's webinar to kick off our offer of the four seasons to our membership for the month of September, all to commemorate the 150th anniversary of signing Treaty One. Uh, Treaty One. As I mentioned, today is the kickoff of our one month educational journey with the four seasons. And to help us with our journeys, uh, we have one of a kind panel of indigenous leaders and mentors in our community. Together, we're gonna dive deep into topics such as truth reconciliation, the meaning behind being part of a treaty, and their hopes for the business community as this truth and reconciliation training uh, commences within our community. So uh, without further ado, let's introduce our panel. Uh, Jessica Dumas is the president of Jessica Dumas Coaching and Training, past chair of the Winnipeg Chamber of Commerce. And I'm so humbled to be the co-chair with her along uh, as the other co-chair for the uh, truth and uh, Tru Chamber's Truth and Reconciliation Advisory Council. She is a professional certified coach who specializes in speaker coaching and business coaching, helping women speak their truth with clarity and confidence. In the past, she's used her passion and knowledge to help businesses create more diverse, inclusive teams by providing relevant solution-based training with a focus on understanding the truth and reconciliation's call to action, specifically art article number 92, which we'll get into today, um, and strategies for indigenous engagement and employment. Recognized for her professional expertise through nomination, Jessica is a recipient of the Manitoba's 150th uh, or 150 Women um, Trailblazer Award from the Neely McClung Foundation for 2021, as well as uh, many other awards. And I constantly tell her, uh, Chi McGwitch, for being a trailblazer for youth, for uh, individuals like myself. So welcome, Jessica. Um, thank you so much for joining today. Jamie Dumont is the newly appointed chair of the Indigenous Chamber of Commerce. She is Métis for, from Saint Laurent, Manitoba. She currently lives in Winnipeg where she spent 15 years working for the province of Manitoba in senior roles in areas including Indigenous and Northern Economic Development, Crown Indigenous Relations, and Community Engagement and Consultation. Jamie has also held the role of Diversity and Inclusion Professional at the Manitoba Liquor and Lotteries Corporation where she assisted in the development and implementation of a corporate diversity and inclusion strategy, including the Indigenous Employment Engagement Strategy. Jamie is currently a private consultant with Indigenous and Northern communities and organizations, as well as conducting workshop design and facilitation. She's also an associate of the Chadwick Consulting Limited and Winnipeg-based consulting firm specializing in Indigenous relations and Northern issues. Hello, Jamie, thanks so much for joining us today. We're very lucky to have you. Next, we have Carly Kimach, uh, Red River College Manager of Truth and Reconciliation and Community Engagement. Uh, Carly Kamach is raising awareness and understanding on the histories of Canada and Indigenous peoples. Her role sees her leading the Indigenous events team, creating staff training opportunities like the Four Seasons of Reconciliation Education, being a bridge between Red River College and the Truth and Reconciliation Committees like the Manitoba Indigenous Education Blueprint, Blueprint Committee, and much more in between. Recently, she has brought in Indigenous speakers like Negan Sinclair, Carol Ann Hilton, which I'm reading Indigenomics, which is absolutely amazing, by the way. Uh, so excited. And uh, to support faculty in indigenizing their curriculum. You can see her, in her, uh, her interviewing inspiring Indigenous alumni and staying the course and in the Staying the Course speaker series. Welcome, Carla. Thank you so much for joining. It's a pleasure to have you today. Founder of the Four Seasons, Andre Kazaban has a Gemini nominee. Andre Kazaban's films has amassed over 1 million views on CBC News World, TVA, Canal D, Radio Canada, and uh, CBC Television. Her works have also been prominently featured in an array of prestigious film festivals. Her documentaries, Awards of the Crown and Family on the Edge, 
have each received the best social political documentary prize at the Golden Sleeve Awards in 2019, uh, which marks the 12th year of her professional and uh, personal commitment to reconciliation. She is a member of the Acad uh, Academy of Canadian Cinema, uh, Cinema and Television. And for Kazabon, this journey cult, uh, culminates in the release of a multimedia um, educational campaign, campaign, Four Seasons of Reconciliation since 2013 in schools and organizations across Canada. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I've actually taken the program myself. It's, it's absolutely amazing. So thank you so much. It's a privilege to have you today. And uh, we have Wayland Sutherland, um, Sutherland, excuse me, is the Chief Executive Officer at the Treaty One Development Corporation and is a proud member of Pegasus First Nation um, and who has also played the lead role in a wide variety of Indigenous business ventures over the past 15 years. As a CEO, manager, and entrepreneur, uh, since leaving the Chief, Inve uh, Chief Pegasus Investment Corporation in 2012, he's been involved in, uh, in the business end of the Treaty One organization and management and he's also graduated from the uh, uh, Asper School of Business in Winnipeg. Thank you so much for being here, Waylon. Um, I think we have an amazing panel and this is gonna be uh, you know, groundbreaking discussions in our business community. So I just wanna thank you all for joining today. And, uh, and without further ado, I think we're gonna jump into uh, the panel discussion right now and, uh, and great, right, right into the conversation around, um, around truth and reconciliation and reconciliation action in our community. But, Without further ado, uh, I think I want to ask uh, perhaps uh, uh, Jessica and, and Jamie, just kind of uh, why is reconciliation important to the business community? And I think with your background, it'd be a great way to start off our conversation on reconciliation. And just wanted to give you an opportunity to give her, uh, give her a, a great audience today um, an idea of, of the type of topic we're going to be discussing and your thoughts on that. Excellent. Good morning. Is it still morning? We may have hit PM already, but uh, so nice to see everyone who's joined. There's a lot going on in the chat. I want to say thank you to Miss Una for the opening prayer and congratulations and a welcome to Noah Wilson for being uh, my co-chair on the advisory council. So welcome to everyone on the panel. Excited about that. Um, one of the reasons that I think that we need to, or what, where the business community needs to focus on uh, truth and reconciliation is being very intentional about inclusion for Indigenous people because the systems that we have now and that are currently existing, those were created intentionally to leave Indigenous people out. So the, the way that we see the system, it was designed to be this way. And so that's why um, when, we, when we look at, uh, you know, why is this important to the business community? Because we need to be intentional about uh, reversing some of the systems that we that we've created. Also, often what we hear the first things that we hear as as Winnipeggers as Canadians is we hear the negative uh, rates of of where Indigenous people are involved. So, for example, high rates of children who are in poverty or child and family services. Um, high populations in um, incarcerated and that sort of thing. But what we don't hear enough about, and once we start building positive relationships and, and doing our research really about who the Indigenous people are in our province specifically, then we start learning how active they actually are in our economy. And that's the conversation that that we need to spend more time talking about. Indigenous businesses, governments, families in 2006 moved $9.3 billion through our economy. And, uh, and so when we hear this, that should allow us to, to know and understand that Indigenous people are true players in our economy. And so building these relationships, learning about truth and reconciliation, history, current events, this is, this is what's gonna help us um, move forward and fill the gaps. Like, right now is an, another time where our economy really needs our attention. And, uh, and the indigenous population is, is where we're gonna find that partnership. And plus it's, it's important because we're really good people. Thank you. Absolutely, and I appreciate that. And you know, the, I think both acknowledging those un uncomfortable truths about those systems that uh, our indigenous peoples that, you know, have, uh, have you know, uh, you know, suffered through and, you know, continue to, uh, you know, work against. I think those are important conversations, but also, 
uh, realizing that, yeah, we are major players in the economy as well. And I think Jamie will have a great uh, view on this as well as the, as the, uh, as the co-chair of the Indigenous Chamber of Commerce. Really excited to hear what, how you feel about uh, what is reconciliation, you know, and why is that, why is that important to the business community? Thanks, Noah, and uh, thank you, Jessica, and thank you, everybody, for joining us here today. It's so great to see everyone uh, here for this really important topic, and um, it lifts my spirits. Um, so just building on a bit of what Jessica uh, mentioned, um, you know, reconciliation is important for business so much so that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission did put out call to action number 92 specific, specifically for businesses in terms of what their role needs to be uh, in reconciliation. And that call to action addresses uh, both what businesses can do internally for themselves in terms of playing that role and helping to um, educate uh, on the truth of the history of our nation. And it also speaks to relationships with Indigenous communities. Um, and, and this is important, um, both uh, to to help uh, everyone to learn more about the the history um, of uh, of treaties and uh, and and sort of what's happened uh, you know in Canada, but also really important in building those relationships. As Jessica mentioned, uh, the nine billion dollar Indigenous economy, and that's that's only poised to grow. Uh, it is a diff it has been a difficult time for business, um, but uh, the Indigenous business community is there and it's growing and it's very exciting and. Uh, it, for businesses to participate in reconciliation, there is tremendous opportunity there for respectful and meaningful relationships and partnerships and really success for everyone. Um, so, um, yeah, so I, like I said, Jessica did a really excellent job covering a lot of the importance of reconciliation for business. But yes, I do think there's a lot of opportunity there for everyone um, and for a role for business, not only to work with Indigenous communities, work with Indigenous businesses, but also to stand behind Indigenous people um, and the issues and matters going forward. Yeah, thank you for that, Jamie. And, and, uh... And I think you both brought up great points is, you know, this, this shift um, in terms of uh, the power that Indigenous peoples are having in terms of economic development in our communities. And I've been reading uh, Carol Ann Tilson's book, uh, Indigenomics, and uh, taking a seat at the economic table. And, uh, and actually, the Nawe Odena developments, you know, formerly known as the Capulon Barracks, was highlighted in the book uh, based on the fact that a project of this magnitude um, you know, establishes a significant shift in the social meaning towards seeing Indigenous peoples as economic powerhouses in our communities. And, and I think Waylon will have a great, um, a great view on this. And um, Waylon, you know, with the, with the 150th uh, anniversary of Treaty 1 signing, you know, what does it mean um, uh, to you being in a Treaty 1 relationship, you know, within the business sphere? And, and how have you kind of um, seen this uh, economic reconciliation in your work today with, with the exciting project at, uh, um, at the formerly known Capion uh, Nawe Odenas uh, developments now? I'm very excited to hear about that. Awesome, no, thank you. And thank you to everyone for joining. Um, you know, I wanna give a shout out to our seven communities for sure, uh, Broken Head, Long Plain, Pegasus, uh, Rosa River, Sagging, Sandy Bay and Swan Lake, 30,000 strong and again, Recognizing the contribution of First Nations, first and foremost, is, is very important. Uh, you know, $9 billion, like, like it was said, is something that's a number that we utilize as well as we move forward. <clears throat> but right from the beginning, um, before I start, I want to recognize, you know, the lost children um, that we lost to residential schools. Um, from that, it's education as well, educating people and understanding our history. That's, that's, the, that's the key uh, for reconciliation as, as far as we're concerned, as we move forward for progress and development. Um, vertical integration is big for us. It's something that, that that's needed right now. It was the epitome of the economy for First Nations when we first started. Our communities were trading. Um, if, if, if one community didn't have a certain product or, or anything like that, another community, that, that, was, that was what trading was. You're going across from, from nation to nation to trade. Now that we, you know, we have uh, certain abilities, especially with Nawe Udana, uh, that gives us the ability to be able to not only develop, but also vertically integrate our, our, our people and give them opportunities to be able to, to contribute to the economy and have spillover benefits so that our First Nations, not just our seven Treaty 1 First Nations, but First Nations in general can have, have a place to live, uh, play, live, um, but also have an opportunity to supply. So that's what we're doing right now. We're doing tremendous amount of due diligence. Uh, again, I want to give a shout out to our, our our elders, our knowledge keepers, because 
they're really uh, giving us the pathway and, and um, historically giving us information that's needed as we move forward to, to address concerns and, and making sure that those opportunities are available in the future. As well as our, our youth council, we have some uh, tremendously smart youth. I want to give a shout out to them because, again, with their ideas, comments, concerns, everything is, is, is giving us a good, uh, giving us the ability to help navigate the waters. But since our country, like since Canada was was started, even before it was started, um, you know, there was there was economies, there was the, the, the fur trade that shows that there was a relationship there uh, between First Nations and non-First Nations people. Uh, the treaty making process with the British Crown was intended to have a good business, mutually beneficial uh, business relationship. And that's something that we want to bring uh, to the forefront, because, again, it, it's not there. There's big gaps, huge gaps. Uh, right now, First Nations have a tremendous amount of land. Uh, there's a gap in agribusiness. A First Nation cannot go, are very limited to go and, and get credit to buy uh, equipment and machinery. The opportunity is there, but they just don't, do not have the ability to do that. And that's something that we need to address. Um, there's, there's, there's players out there. And again, with that economic power, if we have so much purchase power, that should determine when we go out and we, uh, for the supply chain. Why aren't we integrated more into the supply chain? That's something that we, can, we need to recognize as First Nations people and, and, and be able to uh, say, well, we can provide those products and services. We Once we level out the playing field, that's something that's, I mean, that's the epitome of reconciliation. And that's something that our plan is for Nawe Udana, empowering our First Nations and giving them the ability to go out and, and, and benefit. And I'll give a shout out to, uh, you know, I know that everyone is, uh, <laughs> Different schools, Aspen School of Business, uh, for me, was, was very good. It was something that, uh, you know, I, I grew up in the community. I lived there until I was 25. So one day my wife said, uh, you know, we, we need to go in for their education. So, again, with, uh, you know, giving recognition to my, to my lovely wife um, for, for giving me the boot that I needed in order to go and uh, do the things that I wanted to do. And, and lastly, it's not only First Nations supplying First Nations. That's not, that's not what I'm saying. Um, what I'm saying is building a relationship with other First Nations, but this is for everyone. I mean, truly, for true reconciliation, it's it's doing commerce and business with everyone. Everyone wants to do business with us, let's, let's do business. And that, that's, that's what's needed. Recognizing opportunities and being able to work out those relationships to bring them to the forefront. That's for, for us, and that's something that we've been, we've been uh, preaching to not only our First Nations, but our, our leadership. I'd have to give a shout out to our leadership. Uh, without them giving us the guidance and, and the empowerment to be able to do the things that we're doing, I wouldn't be here. And, you know, um, the, at the end of the day, we, we need each other. It's something that, that gives us power as we move forward. And uh, reconciliation is, is, is key for us. It's something that we're, we look forward to doing. So long-winded answer. I apologize to if I bored anyone, but uh, that, that's it for me. Thanks. No, absolutely. I think if anything, you've excited, uh, you know, um, our, our guests today. And I think you, you made some really good points. And um, one of them being is the, the potential of uh, Indigenous partnerships. And, and, and not only does it make, you know, uh, is it the right thing to do from, uh, you know, responsibility to all Canadians to take on truth and reconciliation with their own lives, but also it makes business sense, right, in terms of the, the initial relationships we've created with our, 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 our nations, between nations, our trading relationships. So yes. why not get back to the original kind of relationship that was always intended in Canada? I mean, if you look at the fur trade economy, Indigenous peoples are central to that. And with the natural resource-based economy today and looking at, um, you know, the Capion Barracks or, uh, or the, the development um, that's happening there today, it's like, it only makes business sense to do that. Um, and Carol, Carol Ann Hilton, you'll see that her novel is there. Um, uh, she talks about the potential of a $100 billion Indigenous economy. So I think that just kind of speaks to that as well. One other thing, and I think I'll, I'll, I'll move on to Andre on this, is you mentioned the importance of education. And I'm really glad you brought that up because I think that the conversations around reconciliation in the business community, we can't forget about the aspect of, of truth within reconciliation. So, you know, as per the TRC commissions, you know, at its foundation, the reconciliation has been an exercise in truth telling, um, you know, and as truth is a parallel process to reconciliation, Andre, I think you, you would have a, a great kind of view on this. So what is the stories behind the four seasons of reconciliation? Why did you create it? And, uh, and, and what kind of, uh, what can uh, uh, businesses in terms of content expect from it? And 
and, and, and the role that it plays in truth telling and that parallel process in reconciliation. Yes, thank you so much for, for, um, for hosting this amazing event and um, a big shout out to, to everyone in, in Winnipeg and, and our partner at Red River College um, for, um, for offering um, the opportunity to, to receive the free trial to the course. And I know that <clears throat> Red River College will have a lot more information for you. Uh, but in terms uh, of, of what is Four Seasons of Reconciliation, um, it's an online course. Um, First Nations University of Canada actually has a 40 hour uh, version of this. And so this course is the bite size. So they have 40 hours and this is a two and a half hour to three hour course. And so in this bite size course uh, in partnership with First Nations University, you, um, you have the opportunity to take the course and, and learn from it at your own pace. Um, at the end, you receive a certificate of completion from First Nations University of Canada. And as well, we have a, a social uh, venture program whereby um, funds, 10% uh, of, of all of our proceeds go to um, scholarships for First Nations University and, and it's a national uh, scholarship. Um, and so the course itself is, is really focused specifically on meeting the calls to actions uh, for the workplace um, as a film company in partnership with First Nations University of Canada and authored um, by actually the, the first Indigenous publisher at the Winnipeg Free Press. So it's, it's a beautiful full circle um, uh, who authored this film, uh, Morris Switzer, um, together with First Nations University, Morris Switzer and many Indigenous leaders uh, across the country. Uh, a film on call to action number 92 was, was created. And so that's kind of where our company comes in is in terms of the tech and in terms of the, the tech support. Um, and so they, they authored this, this beautiful film and that is part of, uh, of, the, uh, of the course. Uh, in addition, some of our other films, like for example, that the beautiful Thunderbird um, building in, in Winnipeg is featured in one of our films. And I saw in the chat some folks from the uh, architect sector. And so the Douglas Cardinal um, uh, Architect of the Future film is also provided to, to some of the learners that are more in architect or, or in the field of engineering. So some of these films are part of the course. Uh, and so the course has a mix of films, video, quizzes, PowerPoints, uh, and also another 20 hours of ongoing learning. So you'll hear more about this, but I, I just wanted to provide you with, with some of the context and, um, and so, yeah, so I look forward, I'll, I'll drop a few links in the chat if, if I may, if now's a good time. Um, there's a link there to, to, to see the film um, trailers as well as preview a little bit about the resource. And, and there's also a two minute video trailer of the link. So I'll drop these right now. So if you wanna grab some of this information and also I know Red River College um, our host um, as well this morning will be providing you with more information. Is that helpful for now? I think that would be fantastic. Our, I think our participants would be uh, ecstatic to get that information as well. So thank you for that. And, and thank you for telling, uh, telling us a little bit more about the process behind that and, and the importance of creating a program like this. Myself, I actually took the Four Seasons of Reconciliation program uh, while I was with RBC at the time. And uh, it was a fantastic program. We, I enjoyed it so much, and I think um, uh, we actually made an initiative within RBC to, uh, to, to make it a, a, a commitment within our organizations there. But um, I think in addition to, you know, uh, talking about the importance of reconciliation, we, we spoke on the truth and I really see the four seasons as being, you know, um, one of the first steps you can take in terms of taking reconciliation um, within your businesses. Uh, Ryan Moran taught me you know, uh, the former director of the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation, he says, you know, you can't have reconciliation without first acknowledging the truth. And, and you know, for businesses in our business communities, you know, some of the first steps they can take or actions they can take is acknowledging that truth and the truth of, uh, of, uh, of our history in Canada. And I think Carla, 
um, can speak to a little bit more about how to take action or how uh, the Red River College has been taking action using the Four Seasons of Reconciliation. So Carla, how does the Red River College use the Four Seasons of Reconciliation in their, recon uh, 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 in their uh, reconciliation journey? And, and, uh, and you know, how can our business community maybe follow the lead or, or take some insights from, from your experience with that as well? Well, um, at the college, my position is a fairly new position. So it's only been uh, in existence for two and a half years. And I think the college was definitely a, a leader in designating a position as a manager of truth and reconciliation. Because if you did a look, through, a scan through the post-secondaries throughout Canada and even within Manitoba, we're the only one, I shouldn't say we're the only one, we are a handful that actually have a, that position. Um, a lot of the post-secondaries are committed to truth and reconciliation and embedding those calls to action, but to actually designate a position has been a real leadership, um, um, I guess, uh, it, just, it was just great that the college recognized that it needed to take that big, bold step, right? So at the college, when I first started, I, I took a lot of time that my first year in getting to know different chairs, different deans, faculty members, talking to students, trying to figure out what is that baseline knowledge that the college has. And I found that I was having conversations with people, everything from, I don't know what the term settler means, um, to on the other scale of, I understand treaties, I understand the impact, I understand the current issues today and why they are today for indigenous people. So what that told me within the college was that we needed a foundation of knowledge for all staff, for all students and faculty members so that they would have that common baseline knowledge plus a language to talk about it, right? Because a lot of people were just starting to look at the history of Canada with Indigenous people and what that actually means to them, to their everyday lives to what they were trying to convey and teach to the students. And so I did a lot of exploration around um, with, with the different PSC, PSIs within, the, uh, within Canada. I looked at what was happening within Manitoba and I, and I found that Four Seasons gave that real fundamental base knowledge and that ability to be able to speak on common terms with each other. What it also did was it, it gave that mind to heart learning, which, which you need in order to shift, right? Because you can take that knowledge in, but it's just knowledge. And if you don't incorporate it into who you are and what that means to you and how you want to convey that truth into the world, um, it doesn't, it doesn't, it, it, it won't have the same impact. So for me, Four Seasons gave that ability to have that truth, to have the language, to have that common knowledge. And from there, what I did was I started looking at what are the needs in some of the schools that are happening, like the business and commerce or marketing, um, the School of Indigenous Education, um, what are their needs? And, 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 and I was trying to find that common, common linear gap Right, and and it's big because the college itself is has has you know twenty seven thousand students part time full time, um, and then a staff of about twenty four hundred. So, in order to do that, four seasons met the requirements that I needed for everybody to have that baseline knowledge, and then I was able to build upon that knowledge and go deeper into some of the conversations. And what I wanted to do for that second year was just expand people's minds about what Indigenous partnerships could look like and the possibilities, right? So that's when we, I brought in Negan and then the Carol Ann Hilton to talk about the business potential because people don't think about Indigenous people having that potential or having that type of equity that they could actually participate and produce and we are doing it in Manitoba. And I'm so glad Waylon came on board because, you know, the whole history around the Capion barracks, it took 20 years for that. It went to the Supreme Court. 
for, for the Indigenous people to actually get that land and to develop it. And it was a community endeavor. And there was engagement processes that occurred with non-Indigenous and Indigenous to build the knowledge that was needed for people to accept the fact that Treaty 1 territory is not going to be about a uh, urban reserve, you know, in the sense of poverty, in the sense of uh, lack of housing. It's about business development. It's about being part of, it's about giving something back to the city and really engaging and being part of the whole development. So I think Red River College has definitely made some great inroads in the last two years um, in building that knowledge and building, you know, breaking down some of those barriers. And as we move forward, uh, we're, we're right now in the process of developing a five-year strategic plan, a new one, and then an academic plan that goes with it. And we've got some big commitments because uh, part of that engagement process included staff and students, and they identified those priorities. So we are at the college committed to truth and reconciliation in everything that we do, which includes procurement, which includes hiring, which includes enriching student lives, which in includes research and development and building those partnerships. So in the next five years, um, we're gonna see some really good endeavors coming out of the, out of the college. That's excellent. And I think that gave us a lot of you know, ideas and, and there's some I actually want to speak on, but I think um, more or less, you, you know, you hear a lot about businesses, you know, saying that their organizations, they want their organizations to reflect the communities that they're, um, that they're serving. And when you look at the youth population, uh, you know, uh, growing at a rate that's four times the national average, it's just, um, it, it's, it makes business sense. It makes sense from the education institution in terms of education that our youth and the next professionals will need in terms of dealing with a demographic that's going to be inherently part of our everyday life, both personally and professionally. Um, one other thing you mentioned was, you know, that spectrum of understanding and, and the required learning. That's, uh, you know, when you look at Winnipeg, we have one of the most diverse, you know, uh, diverse uh, populations in all of Canada, and we're going to be at different stages of understanding. So having that base, you know, knowledge with the four seasons of reconciliation can really, you know, be laid out foundation, as you mentioned, uh, for creating those indigenous, indigenous engagement strategies that you were mentioning at the Red River College, that five-year strategic one, and, uh, and building that foundation of knowledge. So, you know, we can lead to that mind-to-heart learning and, and actually take personal and professional actions forward. So um, thanks for that insight. And, and one of those, and, you know, one of the things that I think is important to, to talk about today, and I think Jessica will be able to give us some uh, insight into this, is, you know, with, with this spectrum of understanding, with the, you know, uh, a highly, uh, you know, diverse population in, in, uh, in, in Manitoba specifically, I, I would say across Canada, you know, there's going to be that spectrum of understanding. And, you know, one of the, uh, the things about truth and reconciliation is that, you know, you need to uh, come to face with uncomfortable truths. And, uh, and for, you know, individuals who are on that uh, spectrum of learning and, under, and required learning, you know, those, under, those uncomfortable truths can be, um, you know, quite jarring. And, and, and I think, Jessica, with your background and your coaching and, and uh, in the work that you're doing in the community, you know, how can, how can um, our leaders in our community uh, not only encourage that, that uh, to their, their, their employees to face those uncomfortable truths, but how can we also provide, you know, supports and, and, and be able to manage, you know, the, the, the emotional uh, toll that it takes. I mean, when you look at the, at the horrible stories we've been hearing about, you know, uh, the Greys, and thank you, Waylon, for bringing that up today and acknowledging that. But, you know, based on your experience and, and your coaching, um, uh, how how you know how can we manage that that emotional learning that it takes to to take on those uncomfortable truths and uh, and really acknowledge those and, and, and face them head on. You know, not only as Indigenous peoples, but you know, as everyone's responsibility in Canada uh, uh, to, to to understand this this history and the truth. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Noah. I'm I'm really glad that this question is part of the conversation also, because you're absolutely right. This, this is part of it, right? Indigenous awareness is emotional. If it's not emotional, you're not doing it right. Um, truth and reconciliation work is personal before it's professional. So before you bring it to, to business where you're fully engaged, you need to have a personal investment in it. And it's, 
I mean, many reasons why I find it emotional. Another reason why you might find it emotional is because as Chelsea Vowell says in Indigenous Rights, we all have an emotional connection to what we know is Canada. And so everyone, no matter where it is that you're coming from, you come to this awareness and, and it can be shocking. And so some ways to, to manage it that I would recommend is to talk about it. So if in a workplace, if you can have a, a lunch meetup where people do a sharing circle, um, cir what was the uh, circles for reconciliation? Yeah, there's circles for reconciliation. Yeah, yeah, there's a group that you can call in, uh, but talk about it. Don't hold it in, cry, right? It is emotional. So cry about it, let that out, journal, walk in nature. Um, if you have the opportunity, go to ceremony, go to sweat. But one of the things that I would encourage people to be very careful about is, is letting it out in a negative way. So no ranting. Um, talking about it, of course, is, is really important, but be, being careful not to rant about it. And also not to reach out to Indigenous people and expect them to rationalize or explain or comfort. Um, because this is something that often we're dealing with this every single day. This is our life and we're still coming to terms in, in many cases. And um, when we hear about different things that are happening in the news, these are things that, um, you know, perpetuate the uh, intergenerational trauma. So there are specific people out there. If, if there is uh, someone at a university who is offering this program, there's probably some support through there. Um, so those are some ways that I would suggest to deal with it or to, to manage it, sorry. I'm just going to share in the, the chat the residential school survivor support line. So for Indigenous people um, who are needing that support, there's a 24-hour line to, to provide that support. Yeah, thanks so much for that, Jessica. And I think it's important to acknowledge. Um, and one thing I, you know, I think in, in terms of our work going forward and the work that you've done with the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Roadmap with the Winnipeg Chamber, I think that's a great resource for um, you know, panelists are, sorry, um, participants on the call, attendees on the call to go look at because there's many great organizations, including uh, uh, the Circles of Reconciliation, you know, Four Seasons of Educate, um, of uh, Reconciliation Education, and many others that are actually on that, uh, on that list that can help you, uh, you know, find the experts who are able to shape those conversations. And one thing I did like what you said about, uh, to Jessica is, is, you know, uh, and, and it kind of goes with Carla's comment as well as, you know, in order to have those circles of conversations, you know, I think it's about establishing that foundation of knowledge. And I think the four seasons of reconciliation education is a great way to get that vocabulary in terms of um, the conversations we can have with one another. But all, all of us need to be at that baseline in terms of um, understanding and knowledge and, and be able to move forward before we can have uh, conversations about action and reconcilia uh, reconciliation. Um, I like to say reconciliation because, you know, if you look at the uh, the Royal Proclamation of, or, or sorry, the um, RCAP, um, Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, there was like 440 recommendations that still need to be implemented. And we want to make sure that, you know, the calls to action are forefront in the business community. I think that's a great way to go about it. Um, so uh, I do actually, uh, based on that, uh, in terms of providing that foundational knowledge, uh, Carla, um, so how can organizations, you know, leverage this, this, um, this opportunity that we have with the Winnipeg Chamber right now? Um, so in September, we'll be offering a free month for uh, four seasons of reconciliation. Um, but if you could tell us a little bit more of how they can, um, uh, how this will work for the Winnipeg and Indigenous Chambers and, and, and who it's kind of uh, tailored to uh, going forward and, and how we can, you know, expand this uh, foundational knowledge in our business community. So um, the partnership that we have with uh, Four Seasons and Andrea, I've had the pleasure of working with her for the last two and a half years. And when, when she comes into town, I look forward to her lunches because then we can actually really laugh and tease each other. But um, how it's going to work is that there, there will be, if you log on to the Four Seasons page, there will be a front page there. And then you, you will log on your credentials, your email address, and um, there'll be a welcoming. And then, that, and then Four Seasons will send a link to you. And with that link, you'll be able to log on and take the training. We're suggesting that the CEOs or the HR senior staff take it because we just don't have... Um, the server requirements to do like 10,000 people all at once or 20,000 if you're a big organization, right? So the whole idea is to give people an opportunity to 
test it and see if it's something that they like for their organization. And if they do, then we're also, the college is actually um, entering into another agreement with Four Seasons where we're going to become a distributor for Manitoba for Four Seasons so that we will be able to offer this service to bigger organizations that would like to take it for their entire staff. So we're currently working out that partnership right now, but it's a good opportunity for the college because we truly believe that we have to prepare our students for a work environment that is safe, that is inclusive, that is equitable. And in order to do that as a college, we need to educate the greater community as well. So what I'm loving about today is seeing everybody introduce themselves from the companies and that's great because that means there's an interest, that means there's a willingness to learn. And that means that when they hire our students, they are going to be, they, they will be able to create that environment that is inclusive and safe so that our students can succeed within the work environment. And, and honestly, that, that's what kind of drove us to look at what can we do for the greater community so that our students can succeed not only in college, but in employment opportunities. So that was kind of the baseline of developing um, this partnership, the 150 year anniversary too, to celebrate that and to acknowledge that what can, we, what can we do as a college and what can we do for that community, the greater Manitoba community. So those were the reasons why uh, we entered into this partnership. That's fantastic and I think um, I think our business community is really going to benefit from that and, and having, you know, trailblazers like yourself lead the way for that and, uh, you know, uh, um, you know, Red River College to take that on and, and, and make that a pillar of, of their strategy going forward, I think is amazing and a great way to, uh, to set, set the tone for what's to come in terms of our business community. And I think the great showing today in, in August, I mean, uh, there's lots of vacations and the fact that, you know, we have such a strong showing today is, is just shows the excitement for truth and reconciliation in our community today. So thank you all for joining again. Um, and one thing I think we, it's important to talk about too, I mean, with the recent, um, you know, injustices that have come out with, um, with uh, you know, with the, with, the, with the residential school graves and, and you know, just this, um, uh, with a recent announcement for the National Day of Observance, I think there's a lot of organizations that are coming here today to figure out, you know, how do we, how do we use that day for our staff um, uh, going forward? But I think, um, I think the conversation can't be within, you know, timelines and, and uh, you know, within one time moments. I think reconciliation and truth seeking is a lifetime journey. Um, but maybe, Jamie, you can give us some insight on this in, in terms of, you know, although that this is only a month um, uh, opportunity, I think reconciliation has to be an ongoing initiative of our business community and, and truth seeking has to be an ongoing initiative of our business community. So how can businesses continue on their lifetime, um, you know, journey for truth and reconciliation? You know, what are some steps that they can take? Uh, is it meeting with, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, Indigenous business owners that are coming through for procurement opportunities? Is it, you know, providing more inclusive workspaces? I think it's all of the above, but I'd love to hear, um, I'd love to hear your aspect as the co-chair of the uh, Indigenous Chamber. And I think you get, your, your, your group is doing some really exciting things and working with Indigenous entrepreneurs myself, I'm, I'm very excited to see all of the great, uh, great things coming out of uh, the Indigenous Chamber. Thanks so much, Noah. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, I can't help but uh, also just as Carla and Jessica and, really, really, and Waylon have mentioned, just really stress the importance of building that foundation. Um, it really does start with that truth seeking journey. And, and like you said, no, I agree. Um, it is a lifetime journey. Um, whether you've taken a webinar before or, uh, you know, a course or, 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 or listened to a speaker, um, it, there's always benefit in continuing that truth seeking and continuing to dive deeper into that learning and and uh, this four seasons is another one of those opportunities that I can't you know recommend uh, more um, for for everyone to take um, and really as Jessica mentioned it does start with personal you have to find that truth seeking journey for yourself and then bring it into your business and you might find that as on an organizational level as well um, you know it'll might start with the CEO uh, with your senior HR staff um, but really uh, you know if you're going to bring about change within your own business in order to bring your business on a reconciliation journey it will be very important uh, for everyone within uh, your company um, to uh, start on that truth seeking journey 
for themselves. So um, in terms of next steps, sort of, hey, we've taken all this, we've gotten some education, we've learned a little bit more, what do I do now? And sometimes I think for business that can seem a little intimidating is, you know, what is reconciliation? How do I start? I don't want to do the wrong thing. Um, and, and, and that's, and that's, uh, and that's okay. I mean, that's, uh, that's normal. Um, but here's now an opportunity to look both inwards and I think externally as well, uh, with respect to your business, uh, looking internally at your own structures, your own systems, Jessica mentioned really early on, they were not designed to be inclusive, um, and, and really taking a good look at your own HR policies, your hiring policies, uh, taking a look at your workforce and your, if you've got one, if you're indigenous workforce, um, engaging with your own Indigenous employees as well and getting their uh, participation in, uh, in that reconciliation journey as well. Um, uh, uh, you mentioned procurement, Noah, absolutely. Uh, procurement, especially for the Indigenous Chamber of Commerce, has been a really important topic in terms of how businesses uh, in general can support the Indigenous business community. Um, getting to know Indigenous businesses at the Chamber here, we provide lots of opportunities to do that. Our membership is not exclusive to Indigenous business. Um, so we invite everyone uh, who wants to just even join an event and do some networking, uh, get to know uh, others and build some important relationships. Um, and then you can even go further and just look at, you know, where are you doing business? Uh, which, who's, whose land, uh, which territory are you in? What relationships that you could have that maybe you don't have right now? How are you connecting with, uh, with indigenous communities? Um, and then again, just continuing on that truth seeking journey, I think is, is, is sort of an ongoing thread um, that helps tie all of the important actions that you can take together. So there are a lot of uh, different next steps. And uh, once again, once you build that foundation, uh, you'll be better um, uh, informed and able to then take those important actions, um, like you mentioned, reconciliation action um, on, on building reconciliation. Absolutely. I think you, you, you touched on, you know, many important aspects and um, I totally recommend everyone on the on the call to go check out the uh, Indigenous Chamber. Um, I tell all of my entrepreneurs, I work solely with Indigenous entrepreneurs to put their put their businesses on the directory, you know, um, having those both internal and external uh, Indigenous engagement strategies are crucial, uh, you know, for Indigenous businesses I work with to get that first you know, letter of intent from a, from an established business, um, as well as to provide those inclusive work environments are so important. And I will, I will say as well as, um, you know, uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Roadmap is a great way to, it's an ongoing piece of resource and, and a pathway that you can use as an ongoing basis. It's a living document um, and, and, you know, we'll be continually improving it and, and, uh, and collaborating with our business community. But, you know, that's another way that you can leverage, um, leverage the resources that are out there um, for that ongoing, you know, lifetime reconciliation journey, and certainly more initiatives will come out in the future, and and uh, and very excited for that. So thank you so much for your insight, Jamie, and and thank you for the work you're doing. I know you, uh, it's it's really great for the entrepreneurs I work with, and and uh, and uh, and uh, make sure you check out the directory if you want to have some indigenous uh, procurement opportunities. I would recommend everyone on the call to check that out as well. Um, Waylon, um, I, I do want to get back to you because I think there's some exciting, uh, there's definitely some exciting things happening in the business community. But from your perspective, um, you know, what is your hope when it comes to truth, reconciliation, education, and action for the business community? I think with uh, with um, you know uh, with the development that's happening right now and uh, and, uh, and and the exciting collaborations between um, you know the Winnipeg economy and and, and Treaty One uh, 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 First Nations. You know, what is your hope for that and, and where do you see it going forward as, as we go, uh, as we as we kind of take this journey on together? Well, you know, I mean, a great question. I mean, economic prosperity, first and foremost, I think is, is very, very important. Uh, and recognizing First Nations and, and uh, Indigenous groups have power, recognizing that there's power there. I mean, it's been proven. There's there's studies that show it, the nine billion dollars. Um, you know, changes have been made with that recognition and, and positive changes. Um, that's where the integration model that I talked about, the ability to be able to capture and stimulate the economy, um, because we have Nawai Udana, which is 109 acres, but we have hundreds of thousands of acres on our First Nations right now, with just, just naming the seven uh, individual First Nations at Treaty 1. Um, so being able to capture and help stimulate the economy, and it comes through uh, education, 
one of the things that that we we uh, we went from coast to coast when we first started uh, Treaty One Development Corporation. Our first mandate was let's go and let's go and visit other urban economic development zones. And one of the things that we found was there's um, even though that we 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 had a good relationship or developing and formulating a relationship is there was there was something there so. Uh, banks or relationship with banks and finance in one area were really good in another area maybe not so much what was the reason for that so we we had made a commitment to to create a, a talking group not a formal thing but we called it the indigenous business network and it's uh, our friends in satina are helping us um, formulate and finalize that we went to member two we went to west bank and and really learning uh learning the not only their economies but what we can take and learn as we move forward with Nawe udana and at the end of the day um, having that relationship again covid really really affected a lot of things but you know um it, it also, we adapted to the environment. So um, being able to, and that's the resiliency of First Nations, being able to adapt to the environment. So, but with that, uh, that education is so important and, and understanding, uh, you know, one of the biggest things I, I'd like to accomplish or, or, or help, uh, help with is education on, on business. Uh, helping our First Nations understand that business is not bad. Business is a, is a good thing. Understanding finance, what what is what is different? What does lend what does lending mean? Different types of lending, sweat equity. What does that mean? Um, empowering our First Nations to be able to, if you want to buy a house, well, let's figure out a way to help you buy a house and and purchase a house. And um, but at the end of the day, the underlying factor is helping stimulate the economies of, of our First Nations. Um, you know, being being able to contribute and and uh, have disposable income so that. And recognizing opportunities, like if there's something at Nawe Udana, if we need a supply, supply chain development is is key for us. Uh, it's something I'm very proud to say that with all of the 17 employees that we have here at uh, T1 DC, we're represented at each of our seven Treaty One First Nations. So bringing our smart people back home or working with organizations that help uh, provide their products and services to ourselves. So again, at the end of the day, for us, it's it's making sure that we recognize that we have power. We have, we're strong, strong people and, and, and harnessing that energy in a positive way to help pick us up. Let's, 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 let's support each other. And that's the thing, um, you know, with uh, recognizing our children that were lost with residential schools, they were designed for a reason and recognizing that the truth, what, what, what were they there for, um, you know, to assimilate. Um, and, and it's something that affects each of us as every First Nation or Indigenous person. We're all affected. No one could say they have not, they're not affected. So recognizing that and learning and getting the general public, because I still run into people that said, I had no idea what was going on. I had no idea. So education, not saying that, you know, it's it, not to hide it. Bring it out and let people understand what it was and, and, and learn from it. And so at the end of the day, all that education and, and power and, and bringing people together uh, will give us the ability to uh, pick each other up. And at Nawe Udana giving us, you know, that, that's 109 acres, like I said, hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, that's something working with our young people, it's for the future. Uh, I do have to give a shout out though. Uh, we do have um, uh, a couple of things. If you look on the website, uh, uh, www.treaty1.ca, in 1971 at the, at the 100 year, the, uh, 1971, the 100 year anniversary, uh, the chiefs at the time said, well, we want a week long celebration. They wanted, they, they named a couple of other things that they wanted. So this year we started the, uh, we have a time capsule that we're gonna put into the ground for, to be opened a hundred years uh, from now. And it's something that got our communities all excited. So we have people contributing, but we're gonna be putting videos in there. And again, we wanna show people that, uh, we wanna show our future, you know, our great grandchildren and things like that, that we work together. It's not just one person. It's not one person that's doing all this. I mean, I'm just I'm just the handsome face to Treaty One, but there's thirty thousand people that you know are have given me the ability to to uh, to bring this to the forefront. And and I have a strong team. I want to recognize them as well. Uh, I want to recognize our leaders. And Noah, I haven't met you yet in person, but I, I look forward to sitting down with you because again, you're the you're you're exactly the type of people that that uh, we need as we move forward. Um, uh, in, in general for, for the development of, of our communities, not just Treaty One, but in, in overall, we need, we need positive role models to be able to show people that um, the future is, is bright. And uh, if we work together, people can benefit. So long-winded again, my apologies, but uh, 
that's that's it for me. So thanks. No, oh, I appreciate it, Waylon. And uh, as a Pegless member I, I, myself, I'll say being handsome is a burden we do have to take on. <laughs> but um, I'm just I digress. Um, uh, but anyways, I think we're we're coming up. To, you know, we could have this conversation for six hours if you ask me. And I think uh, one of the things, that, and Caroline Hilton, I think she says, you know. If you've been able to look at what, you know, First Nation community, Indigenous peoples, Métis and Inuit have been able to do with the cards stacked against us, you know, wait until the business community and the rest of Canada, you know, start to work with us and support us and, and make us a pillar of their Indigenous engagement strategies, of their strategic models going forward. Um, and because it just makes business sense. And I think, uh, you know, Nawe Odana is just a, a perfect example of that. And, you know, you, you know uh, I think there was a, um, an estimation that uh, by at 2016, I think we provided 32 billion to the Canadian economy. And Carol Ann uh, Hilton talks about a $100 billion economy in the future. But um, thank you so much for that, Waylon, and, um, and everyone on the call. But unfortunately, that's all the time we have today. Thank you so much to each one of our panelists. You know, I mean, like, we'll have to book another six-hour one, and hopefully people can take time out of their day, because I think this conversation could go on for, uh, for days on end. And then we hope to continue it forward. But um, uh, thank you for taking the time to share your stories, um, educating our business community on the importance of truth and reconciliation. No, reconciliation is an ongoing journey, um, but we don't have to do it alone. Uh, as we commit to learning about the truth, uh, true history of this land, we encourage our chamber membership to uh, come together as a community to share and learn together in a safe space. Um, so that's why on uh, September 14th and 28th, we're hosting two virtual community roundtables with Elder Una, Miss Una, um, to share what we've learned and how we feel um, after taking the four, se four seasons of reconciliation course, that a chance to build a foundational knowledge and, and have those opportunities to speak after. Um, so, and of course, if you're interested in signing up for the one month free access for four seasons, uh, Carla was so kind to give us some updates on, on how to do that and who it's targeted for. Um, please visit the winnipegchamber.com uh, to learn more. Keep in mind that this is a new initiative. Engaging interest is gonna be uh, uh, fluid in response. Um, but uh, there are capacity limits in terms of the server ability, as Carla mentioned, for free trial. So we ask that you be patient with us as our goal is to offer this um, uh, to as many members as we can. Again, visit cha uh, winnipegchamber.com to learn more, uh, to read our four seasons uh, 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 frequently asked questions. With that said, it's been an absolute honor and privilege to uh, be your host today and moderator. Thank you all for taking the time out of your day to be here with us, and we look forward to seeing you. Um, at our roundtable discussions on the 14th and 28th. That's the 14th and 28th, everyone, two, two available. Everyone have a, a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Wish we could have had more time with our guests today, but uh, it's been a privilege and an honor. Everyone, please take care.